talk to you just for a minute. Uh, but one of them is you look around, you know, and everybody in here agrees that we need to have a shirt on, right? You look around, every, nobody has the same shirt. It's all different. Um, when I got up this morning and looked in the mirror, I thought this looked good. And some of you might be like, <laughs> need some help, but it's all I have to work with, so you just have to do the best you can. So everybody has their own tastes and their own style and their own interest. You hear falconry called an art, you hear it called a sport, but ultimately you have to say, well, what's my, what's your interest personally? And that varies from somebody that just wants to go out and kill stuff, chase ducks with a short week and that's that's it they want to hunt and that's totally fine if that's what makes you happy that's fine other people are have almost no interest in that they want to fly a falcon just to push the limits of what the falcon can do to see how high they go to how fast they go their level of hunting and catching quarry is maybe a lot lot lower and their expectations are a lot lower one is not necessarily better than the other it's just what makes you happy so I get asked a lot, you know, well, my bird's doing this, what should I do? And, and as you grow, get into falconry, you'll have guys do the same thing. And one of the things that I've kind of come to the conclusion of is if you're driving home from flying your bird and your bird's happy in the truck, bird's happy when you get home, you have a smile on your face, you're doing it right. Doesn't matter what anybody else's expectations are, it doesn't matter, you know, what anybody's telling you. If your bird's happy and healthy and you're smiling, you could be just going up on the hill and stooping it to the lure and, you know, the bird's fit and happy and healthy and you, that's your expectation and you're happy, then you're, you're for, for what you want, you're doing it right. Um, I see a lot of guys get really frustrated with wanting to catch stuff maybe not knowing how to go about it and different things like that. Um, so that kind of brings us into the learning curve of the mentorship program or the sponsorship program that we call it. And I've been really fortunate to have rubbed shoulders with some great guys as I grew up through my teenage years and into my, you know, now I'm an old fart and I still appreciate rubbing shoulders with these guys and learning little bits and pieces of information as you go along. So um, one of the things I really encourage you is to, you know, tag along with people when, they, when they'll allow it. Um, see different guys flying birds. Decide what your expectations are and decide what your goals are and then find somebody that's doing that and learn from them. Everybody's a wealth of information, but are they doing what you want to see done? Are they actually, do you go out with their bird and not only do they talk the talk, but do they walk the walk? And then you say, okay, I want to, I want to have my falcon or I want to do my hawk like that. And that might be flying a Harris hawk at jackrabbits in a cast. It might be flying a hybrid at grouse. And everybody's going to do it different. If you came to me and asked me to help you fly a Merlin on starlings, I wouldn't know shit. I'd have to tell you to go one of these Merlin guys or something. So, uh, and, you know, everybody has their own expertise and their own areas where their interests are. Um, most of you have probably had professors or teachers or uh, uh, that, that you learn from differently. And you learn sometimes, this is one analogy I have with a flight instructor, I'm a pilot. So I'll kind of use this as a little bit. Is when you first start learning to fly, you don't know anything about flying, right? You don't know how to run an airplane or what you're supposed to do or the protocol. So your instructor is like, what he says is gospel. Well, I flew with two or three different instructors and got soloed and then I, I ended up flying later on finishing up some things with an, an old crop duster pilot and just learned that man I just didn't learn anything from the first two or three guys this guy knew so much more he was so good 
And not only that, but when you'd tell him some of the other things that we'd done, he'd be like, yeah, yeah don't, don't do that. Just totally forget that. So you learn that. That's the same way with falconers. You know, we're all on our own journey. We're all learning at different levels. We all interpret things differently and then apply that to our relationship with our birds differently. So you'll find that sometimes what somebody tells you is maybe what works for them and how they interpret it, but maybe that's not going to work for you. And maybe somebody else that you go out and fly with and you relate that to them, you know, might go, yeah, I don't know about that. So you have to learn to kind of take everything with a teaspoon of salt. Um, learn that people interpret things differently. Birds are different. Birds are individuals. And see how that kind of incorporates with what you want to do, where you want to get to with your bird. Um, one of the things that I've, I've talked to, um, you know, like when, when you talk to groups of scouts or young men or different things, that I've, I've tried to reiterate with our birds is their potential. And I see, I see falconers always limiting the bird's confidence and its potential. Um, so you are going to have a relationship with your bird. You are going to go out with your bird and do what makes you happy. But at the same time, always remember that your bird is an individual. This package, this, <coughs> this beautiful peregrine sitting on the block in the backyard that's a new bird, maybe chamber-raised bird, maybe a captive bred bird, doesn't know anything, doesn't know what it's capable of. So by your hand and by your skill, you unlock that and tap into all of that potential. And a lot of birds can get, um, in, in our minds, ruined because of lack of skill or lack of mentorship or things like that. Falconers get discouraged. And a lot of times that's because they're trying to go out and do something that they're misinterpreting how it's done. Maybe they don't have the right guidance to get from point A to point B where they want to be. The bird gets frustrated. The bird loses confidence. The falconer gets frustrated. So I think always keep in mind that, that the bird is an individual. The bird has loads of potential. Um, and think, well, if Mother Nature was just had that bird, where would it be right now? Um, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be where it is if, if you're doing things wrong. Um, so if, if you, if you look at that and you think, um, what the possibilities are, and then we flip back to learning, there's a, an article I wrote for the, um, American Falconry and a saying that I actually learned from a horse, a guy who does horsemanship that I just love. <clears throat> and Let's say I had a gold ring on. I often have a gold ring, but this time of year I usually take it off so I don't rip my finger off on fence posts and stuff. But if someone were to just hand you a piece of gold jewelry, would you turn it down? Is it worthless because you didn't make it? Is gold necessary? Is it necessary if you have gold jewelry, a uh, bracelet or necklace that you made it, that you went out and found the gold in the hills and did it? No. So this saying is, is uh, second-hand gold is as good as new. Mm -hmm. I, can't experiences, ex I can't experience experiences for you, but I can share them with you because second-hand gold is as good as new. So as you start out, you don't want to try to necessarily reinvent the wheel. An old master and an old mentor that says, hey, this works. This is a good way of doing this. A lot of times there's a reason for it. Those, those, uh, that wealth of knowledge with trapping birds, with manning birds, you get into flying a lot of the, a lot of the wild caught birds and guys who are just, just experts at it, at a level that's just so admirable. That wealth of knowledge is right there, and they've gone through their learning curve and they've messed up and they've learned things and they've learned from other people in the pool that, so it's foolish not to just say, hey, this guy's really good at this and I want to just do everything I can to soak up and learn his technique, his teachings, and what he does, and emulate that, incorporate that into what I'm doing with my own falconry. 
Um, so that's something I want you to really remember that saying, secondhand gold. You know, don't go through all the same mistakes somebody else did to get to where they are. You still will. Everybody here is going to lose a bird. Everybody here is going to have a bird die from mismanagement. Everybody's going to have broken feathers. Days when you drive home discouraged. That's just part of the journey. I mean, you kind of have to taste the bitter to know the sweet, right? But really taking advantage of the, the, the neat individuals that we have in our, our falconry community. With There's just a ton of knowledge out there. Um, just for an example, I want to just give you some examples. I'm Gerald. When I met Gerald, I mean, my learning curve just went whew. You know, all of a sudden I have this guy that at the time I didn't know Gerald was some, you know, very well-known falconer. Uh, but you learn all these things and you're just soaking it in. Um, Ricardo, meeting Ricardo and, and his, his tutelage and things that he knows. Um, I went, I had the opportunity just out of high school. I worked for the Widener family up in Sheridan, Wyoming. And uh, Pete Widener was just such a wealth of knowledge with peregrines and his knowledge about captive breeding and bloodlines. Um, Dan Conkle, you know, training jerk falcons with Dan Conkle um, was, was just a huge eye-opener um, for me. Um, Jack Orr, the same way. Saw him do things with birds that I never saw anybody else ever do. And so you just drive home this just there's a lot of really smart guys out there um, with a lot to learn from. So just take one second and go to the literature. Um, one thing that I've kind of found with literature is maybe not everybody that write book, write, writes books um, should. And not everybody that should write a book does. So, and I found that to be pretty true. There are some fantastic books out there. There's a lot of wealth of information, but as I've learned and progressed in my own falconry and the way I interpret it, I've read some of the older, you know, the books that I read as a kid and you kind of reread them and you're like, oh, you know, why did this guy write this? This is, this is really bad advice, you know. Um, so you also want to, as well as the, the mentorship and the guys you're rubbing shoulders with and talking to, keep in mind that just because something written is written, it's not scripture. You know, take all of that with a grain of salt. There's some great stuff written, and some of the best stuff is the old stuff. The, some of the oldest literature, um, when you read it, you're like, yeah, that's that's gospel right there. That's really means something. I don't know if you ever read King Frederick, any of you, or Latham. Latham is probably one of my favorite books to read. It's really hard to read because it's in Old English. Um, but Simon Latham really was a good falconer, like an amazing falconer. The Posnama. This and some of you, some of you younger falconers maybe have never heard this. So if you want to jot it down. The Bosnama Nasheri was written by Tiger Mirza. He was a Persian falconer. And this was a this translation was done by an Englishman of this works, but just really amazing advice in there. Um, so a lot of those a lot of those things, you know, falconry everybody agrees on has been around for what, at least five or six thousand years. Depends on who you talk to. Some people say four, some people say eight. But it's been around for a long dang time, right? So you don't necessarily need to try to reinvent the wheel, but you do want to think, there's a lot of different tires I can put on that wheel, and a lot of different places that wheel can take me. And that might be a wheel on a Ferrari or a Jeep or a Harley, just kind of your own personal pace you know, where you want to go with your birds. Um, so being able to, being able to, uh, to recognize those goals and where you want to be and get there by being an open-minded and um, taking advantage of what you can take advantage of as far as what's available to learn with. Um, is my best advice to you from what's helped me grow up. 
I don't know if that's as long as what Robert wanted me to talk, but I'm happy if I can sit here for two hours if you want to ask questions. Um, anything you guys can fire at me that you you think as a as a beginner, as an apprentice falconer, I'm frustrated with this. And maybe somebody's been through that or we can point you in the right direction or whatever. But uh, oh, one, one thought that I kind of reflect back on that you guys get a kick out of that was a real eye opener for me as far as learning from people was when I started flying eagles. We started getting into eagles when they first started being legal to trap. Um, so the eagle I have now is 25 years old. And I've had her probably 20 of those, 18 of those years maybe, something like that. And uh, we weren't allowed to take eagles early on. I think the first year that they were allowed to trap was like 96, 97, right in there. And then there was just a few guys that were given depredation permits. And as I first showed an interest in it and started working on paperwork and trying to get them and trap them, it was amazing how all of a sudden everybody was an eagle expert. <laughs> <laughs> you know, how this guy was, oh, he did this and that, and he, he has to tell you everything he knows, you know. And then you you really get into it and get handle them and you realize, man, those guys did not know anything about these. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of a fun experience because you were starting in North America and in the U.S. It was something that was largely, you know, unknown. There was not really anybody doing flying eagles. And so your your ability to call somebody and say, hey, you know, what's your advice on this was really limited to, like, two people you know <laughs> I mean you really narrowed it down and so one it was interesting to talk to those guys that had actually flown one who had actually succeeded and then dispel a lot of those myths you know and and uh, that, that that was one thing actually I kind of skipped over was the uh, the real eye-opener on intelligence and uh, and being able to Probably the eagles taught me that more than anything, was how intelligent birds are. So, you know, people are always, uh, as we grow up, you hear the phrase bird brain, and, you know, we're training the birds through operant conditioning and all this. And um, you kind of have this, this prejudice that, you know, we're up here and the birds and the animals are down here. There was an interesting article in National Geographic did about a year and a half ago. I don't remember exactly the issue, but where they they did a study on bird brains and on the neurons in the brain, and it was really interesting to read. And if, I highly recommend you look it up because if you think about it, birds are how old? I mean, the the when 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 humans were you know we evolved to where we are when dinosaurs were already really advanced when the bird bird hip dinosaurs were already a hunting machine they had great eyes great smell great everything they were like really highly evolved the mammals were like bulls okay so they're they're way ahead of us and they they found you know that the brain neurons work differently just like the eyes you know, the eyes are so much more highly evolved, but so is the brain. The brain neurons and the brain cells work differently than a mammal's. They found that out, that it's not just the size of the brain, but it's the, it's the performance that that little brain can do. And I have found that the cognitive ability in a lot of the birds is, is far surpasses what our prejudices are, what we think sometimes. Um, seeing birds be able to calculate um, setting up hunting tactics and that's something you really see with the eagles is um, especially wild eagles you watch wild eagles hunt or a pair of wild peregrines and you see them do things setting up an attack on something using using a hillside to conceal themselves um, you know watching an eagle one eagle come down one hillside to flush or get the attention of something while its mate comes in the other way and timed timed perfectly and just unbelievably deadly. And you think, those guys are way, way smart. I mean, just almost to the point you kind of get chills. You're like, 
you know, if they were hunting us, we would be the old different ball game, right? And then the same with, you know, you seen, I've seen the wild peregrines, you know, one of them flushing, the other one up here, you know, ready to pull the trigger on them. So as you get working with your bird, those, those, those thoughts that we have or prejudices, I guess is the best way to put it, of their intellect and how they relate to the world, um, always keep that as a real open mind. Hey, this thing looking back at me has a soul. It's an individual and it's, it's way smarter than what you think it is. Um, yeah. What's been your most memorable hunt with your eagle? My most memorable hunt with my eagle? Yeah. Oh, there's been a lot. Uh, there's been some pretty neat ones. There's a uh, I had, I had one time, uh, she was up, she was up really high, like one of these little teeny specks on the ceiling, and uh, off at an angle of ways, and I, I got up a um, duck, and, and it just started to kind of leave, and I didn't see where she went, I just was focusing on it. And there was a, I was kind of on the berm of a hillside that came up in a little, little bit of brush. And she was using that and me to conceal herself coming in. And she came by me just fully trimmed up. And I mean, it made like the sagebrush go like this when she came by. <laughs> it really, I mean, it was neat. Just right past, just a couple feet past me, just fully trimmed up and was going so fast that she was just immediately down there and on it and, poof, and I that was one day you were you know like you say I went home I was smiling <laughs> so you're doing it right right it just depends on, on what your couple